This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. I'm very glad to talk to you, and uh, I can say it's a kind of mixture of feelings, and um, and they have been shifting a little bit also in the last five weeks already. I even don't believe it's to start with this. I even don't believe it's already five years, uh, five weeks that uh, I'm not seeing Lokman anymore. There was and there is still this complete disbelief that it happened. I mean, I feel sometimes, um, I, I feel not only sometimes, I feel often that I just need to wake up from a nightmare or that I just need to go out of a movie um, that, uh, that, Lokman will come in any moment. So um, there, most of the time, I have this feeling it's not real. I mean, I have to wake up in one way or another and all will be good again. Then there are these moments um, which I try where the truth is very is 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 coming up. I mean, uh, where I really, uh, where I I'm fully aware that I lost Lokman physically, and um, I think I'm oppressing these feelings for different for the moment, for different reasons. Um, they are too painful. They are too overwhelming and I need for the moment, I need to be strong. Uh, I need to continue here um, and uh, I, in this moment, I cannot allow myself to be overwhelmed by my sadness. Then there's another feeling, which is really, how you say it, uh, colère in French. <laughs> uh, angerness, but much more than angerness. Um, and this is my driving force in the moment. Mm. Anger, and there should be another word which is much stronger than anger. It's what is making me moving. And the anger is at least as strong as the sadness. That is exactly how I felt. The, the rage pushes you forward. And it's your decision whether or not to make that a positive or a negative force. And I know by default, you've chosen a positive route. But it's the same feeling of if you slow down a bit, and if you don't act on it, it can be not just overwhelming, it can be lethal, the feeling, that inner volcano. And I, I really appreciate that you're finding the route that serves you best just weeks later. It took me months. I um, Something that happened, I, I don't know if it's the same for you, just the fact that I was always being interviewed and you had cameras all the time and you have people calling and people wanting to talk to you. 
it allowed me years ago, seven years ago, to in a way pretend like I was on a I was on a TV show that this is just acting, it wasn't real. But I'm getting from you that maybe the the rawness has already begun to settle in, that there's an acceptance already. It took me longer. And in a way, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I, I am from what you're saying, I'm I'm hearing it that the reality has already settled in. That this is not just sort of navigation right now. This is a, a brutal acceptance that's ha- that's happening to some degree quite quickly. There are these moments. There are really these are moments, but um, mainly also, uh, yeah, you're right what you are saying. I mean, the, all this attention, the visits, uh, media, and, 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 um, yeah, it provokes this feeling. It's, it's, it's just a movie. Yeah. And um, yani deep down in myself, I know, yani I know what happened. So, but on the other hand, um, yeah, it's completely real. It's an exceptional journey that you've decided to take after losing Lukman, that you've decided to keep his work alive. And I think that is a very noble cause. And I want to jump into your your shared passion and your shared work. And there's a lot to say here. And before we dive into Umam and, and Hanger and all that is collective memory, I don't know something that I think is important. How did you meet? And I feel silly asking this question, but all I know is that you and Lukman had this thing together in Irbeire. It's not my place to kind of pry and wonder how did these two people cross paths? I mean, I'm sorry for this being a bit naive, but I'd like to hear it from you. I don't want to find it online or through a third party. How how did this love story start, if I may ask, and how, how far back does it go? Uh, in summer, it would be 20 years. So we oh, met okay. in 2001. I came to Beirut with a film project, a film about the massacre of Sabra and Shatila. I was staying with friends and uh, these are Ali Atassi and Sonia Mesha. So one evening, Ali was giving a lecture in the co-house about Syria, and I was very interested. And uh, at one point, I didn't really listen all the time to the lecture, (laughs) but much more to a person who was facing me and who looked at me. So this was Lokman. And Ali, Ali Atassi, he introduced us with the words, you both, you should talk together. You are interested in the same morbid topics. (laughs) (laughs) What's the introduction? Oh, that's lovely. So you had a familiar interest in the subject, and that's really what drew you together at the beginning. Yes. Yes. So um, I had been coming with this film project. We co-directed the film together mm. uh, between 2001, 2004. Um, and the film ca- gave somehow was one element. The film was maybe the key element why we found it just afterwards, Umam documentation and research. Right. And Lukman and I, I mean, uh, we were, we are very different, but we, we are, well, I'm still in the present, but uh, we are, we were very contemporary. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I have been spending with Lukman my last 20 years almost in life, in work, in everything. So I feel somehow, I mean, they have been not only killing Lokman, they have been killing also a part of myself. I think you have found a way to exactly describe a lot of the, uh, a lot of the abnormality 
that someone like you is going through and how too many people have gone through in this country. I'm, I'm going to mention this from the beginning. Long ago, maybe the early years of your relationship with Lukman, but right before Omam started, uh, I met somebody who later worked at Omam, uh, Amanda Abi Khalil. And I, we were friends. We met, I think, at a film festival in uh, Sofil. This could be 2003, maybe. And uh, by 2004, we, we, were, we were friends. And I knew that she had started doing work at Umam. And I had other friends that were going to Ghbayri regularly, talking about this sort of this new, this new center. And once I had to sort of go and pick up somebody. So I made my way to Ghbayri. And I think that was my first sort of insight into this, I pardon the cliche here, this oasis. Of, of knowledge, of learning, of whatever you want to call it, of unity and of shared embrace over whether it's the civil war, whether it's the missing, whether it's any painful subject that Lebanese prefer not to discuss in Beirut, but in a neighborhood that I did not know well. And I think the last time I went to Ghbeiri was in 2006, before the July war. And then I, I mean, I, I can't remember another time that I went until I saw you just a few weeks ago. So there's a glitch in my own upbringing, in my own adulthood, where this became almost, I think I fell into the trap, where unless you have a good reason to sort of go to Ghbeiri, you don't go. And I'll say this up front, I think this is exactly what you were fighting against. And it's not, um, I don't think it was a deliberate decision. I think it's just gravity. You end up sort of veering in a different direction and you don't think about it much. Although I always saw people in different circles who were affiliated with Umam and, and this is not just Lebanese, foreigners. And many of them we know together. So I feel, I feel like I missed out on something, which is uh, having known you more and having known Lukman better. And I'm sorry I'm talking too much here, but I'll just say one more thing. Uh, I should have better, I should have either eyeglasses or at least I should wake up from time to time. It really, it really upset me that you met me in Olio or you were sitting next to me in Badaro with Lukman and I didn't notice. <laughs> That's my fault. You were being polite. Oh, this guy's having a deep conversation. Leave him alone. I wish I knew you were there. I could have turned and said, oh my God, it's Monica and Lukman, but I'm stupid. I don't see things <laughs> right away. So I wish, I wish you interrupted me then. I'm sure it was an important conversation. <laughs> Let's go back to the initial inception of Umam and, and Hangar. Was it a deliberate, was it a deliberate sort of uh, project at trying to heal wounds? So in other words, it's the wounds that bring you and Lukman together. It's the morbid subject that maybe pulls you together. Is there a deliberate decision to touch on the things that are hurtful and find a way forward? Or is that just a byproduct of collective memory in Lebanon? That there isn't much else really to talk about right now, that a lot of it, for better or worse, is pain and violence. No, it was a decision. Mm. And um, I mean, um, we really both believed um, it's important to go back to the past and to enter this, I mean, don't forget I'm German. Um, for me, I mean, I'm the generation in Germany for which it became normal that you have to deal with the past. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm really coming from this background. It's part of my culture. And Lukman, for him, it was as important as for me. So we really found ourselves, um, uh, we found it necessary to, to go deep, to touch on, on the wounds, because we really both believe, believe that a healing process can only start when, yeah, when you do it. And uh, no, and I mean, maybe I should also say the film Massacre, it's uh, about Sabra and Shatila. Yes. Not a film about, um, it's not a film about the survivors. It's a film about the perpetrators. 
And uh, we felt that we, uh, and I mean, and it was very difficult to do it. And uh, we felt we need to, to touch on the wounds and also to give the voice to the perpetrators, which was really by itself not an easy process because neither you want to become an accomplice nor you can be really the judge because then nobody will talk to you. So it was a kind of borderline game. And um, yeah, no, it was a real decision to go into this direction. And we felt somehow that everybody should have the right to do so. And therefore also for, from the beginning, one of the aims of UMAM was to build up a kind, what we always called citizen archive, mm -hmm. which is really accessible to everybody. And uh, of course, this kind of archive, uh, we consider uh, our film rushes also part of, uh, of this archive. It can be oral history, it can be documents, it can be a lot of things. No? So no, and uh, it was from the beginning a deliberate decision. You know, I think I stumbled ac across an, something from a hotel once that was affiliated with Umam. It's almost like notes that were preserved from the hotel district during the fighting. And even that's sort of part of the archive too. Yes, yeah, and I mean, a part of the archive. Uh, we yeah. managed, one managed at one point uh, to cut uh, to cut a street lamp, which somebody exercised his shooting. Huh? So this is for us also a kind of document. Mm. I mean, for several years we had the famous bus in from Ein Romane here in Um. Of course, yes. It was one of the most important documents, if you want. Yeah, I recall that, and actually, I think that was a. It, it's almost. Actually, you tell me if this is right or wrong. It exposes a serious failing, at least on the state level, that this is not something taken seriously by the state. It's almost left to NGOs to handle it. That bus should not be the deliberate hard work of an NGO trying to acknowledge something that went wrong. And then you, you're, you're filling that gap. D did you see your work in that sense as well? Sort of doing maybe maybe what other governments have done better. And that could include potentially the German government, that they have found a way of embracing collective memory as opposed to this country. Of course, I mean, uh, I, I, mean, I was uh, really always astonished when we had uh, public events here and we had also officials coming to these events that nobody who was putting into question why this bus is in Oman. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> everybody liked to make uh, uh, selfies with the bus, and <laughs> <laughs> but nobody ever questioned the fact that the bus was here. And uh, when the bus left again, because the owner took it back, also, nobody questioned where is the bus now, for example. Right. So we have been, yes, we have been feeling that we are, uh, full, we are fulfilling gaps, a lot of gaps which are here in Lebanon with our own modest means. I mean, we can do what we are able to do and we will continue to do so. But I mean, we are not, we are an NGO, we are not a state institution. Right. And I think that that sort of just, it exposes where the attention is. I, I, I had to do a lot of my own individual research when I was putting together an episode about Martyrs Square, the history of Martyrs Square, not, not old history, modern history from the late 19th century until today. And it was so much work going from the Sursot library to AUB, to an I, I I went almost everywhere I could, at least trying to find some footage, even to the photojournalists themselves, even George <laughs> Azar. So, sorry? <laughs> That's exactly, no, no, you're absolutely right. And it's sort of, 
You, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't say anything else. You're absolutely right. <laughs> but, but even re reaching out to the photojournalists who took part and had great photos, and, and it costs money. It's not something that somebody can easily do for free. You have to have either the goodwill of these institutions, or sometimes you have to pay for them too. And it's not something that a citizen has easy access to all the time. So I really think that that's without UMA and without these types of institutions, I think it would be completely unknown. You'd have to really depend on these, maybe unfortunately several books only. And then now you have a rich archive that, it, that brings it to life, which I think is, well, this is what my passion is. And I, I, I'm curious about 1989 in Berlin and 1989 in Lebanon. And you, you mentioned something which resonates with me. I think it's the same week, if not, it's, it's almost the same date that the Berlin Wall, people started chipping at it. And I'm old enough to remember what it was like on TV when you have individuals sort of breaking, chipping away parts of the Berlin Wall. I think it's the same date, if not the same week, Ta'if is signed, that ends Lebanon civil war. Can't think of a completely opposite experience than these two cities. I have been to Berlin many times, and I think even if I'm not curious about Berlin's history, it's there. And I don't need anyone to tell me what happened. I can go and find out on my own. And you can spend days on end just learning about recent memory in Berlin. I spent 15 years trying to do something like this in Beirut, a walking tour that would show Beirut's history in a way that I could on my own, but it shouldn't be my job. It should be available everywhere. And I'm curious from your side, having lived in this world for such a long period of time, can you point at exactly what's gone wrong in Beirut, or at least in the Lebanese experience? where these issues are not at the front and center, rather they're on the back burner. That something like collective memory, it exists, but it, maybe it's not central, it's tertiary, it's on, the, it's on the margins. Yet in a city like Berlin, it's always there. And it's, I don't, I don't think it's forced down anyone's throat, on the contrary, it's just, it's there if you want it. And if you don't want it, you'll still learn something by default, just being, being in Berlin. So I'm curious, is there, a, is there a wider problem that Lebanon is experiencing? Why there's this glitch? I mean, there's a huge problem that the whole problem is that in Lebanon, you don't have a culture of, or you have a culture of complete impunity. And this is, I mean, the, um, I went after the Second World War, I mean, thanks to Amer the Americans, we had the Nuremberg process and la uh, later we had other processes, but I mean, here uh, you had um, the, no, um, you have this culture of impunity, which is going for years back and uh, you have the amnesty law, nobody was responsible for anything. And uh, so, of course, also, you don't have any process, official process of dealing with the past. So, I mean, for me, everything is starting somehow there. This culture, and as there was no process of dealing with the past, it, this fact is also allowing that the culture of impunity is just going on. And, um, uh, not to talk about Hezbollah, I mean, uh, in a democratic country, I don't know, you cannot tolerate a party which is somehow stronger than the state itself, which can decide like in 2006, when, uh, if it want to start wars. Um, and, 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 I mean, it's endless. You don't, uh, to go out of politics, you don't have public places. I mean, I remember that I was in the 90s, I was here as a freelance, very young, but as oh. a freelance journalist. Mm. And I remember very well when, for example, Fayrouz was giving in 94 a concert. I recorded yes. this concert. In Martyrs Square, it was in... Yeah, that's what 
I'm talking now because you mentioned Martha Square. Yes. I recorded the concert. I still have the recording. Hmm. And they demolished more than 100 buildings. Yes. And the people there. And the pretext was the concert of Fairuz. So um, <laughs> these. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, uh, I can give thousand examples, really, I can give, you don't have public places, you don't have really museums, you have now the Beit Beirut, which was supposed right. to become a museum, yeah. also for the Civil War, uh, you don't have nothing, it's, it's an event place, or before the explosion, it used to be an event place. But, um, so what you have in this, from, from the state side, there is just nothing. And from, uh, from the official side, what you have, you have a lot, a lot, a lot of private initiatives. And right. this for me made Beirut always very rich. But to, uh, they can, and they can fill the gap to a certain extent, but not completely. But this, this wider issue of impunity, and I'm, I'm glad you took me back to earlier years. It's not something that's recent. It's, it's almost existential at this point. That, that, that inability to hold criminals to account. And I know mis maybe it's an unfair question, but do, because you're in the world of collective memory, and because that is really the wider story when it comes to collective memory, we're not talking about sensitive issues largely because those criminals were never held to account. It's almost that there's a direct correlation there. Can you point the finger in any direction when it comes to our story in particular? And, and I know that Umam is covering not just Lebanon, that there's a regional component to it, but I, I think the emphasis remains on this country. And if there's a way to narrow it down to the Lebanese experience, is it born out of sensitivity? that we're not able to confront certain things because of a fear that things would get worse. And I'm curious why it isn't easier to sort of reconcile on the past and say, this is what happened. There's bad actors here and there have been bad actors throughout our history, yet we're not able to sort of even, even forget name them, even address the subject to begin with. I mean, it's, uh, you don't, I, I don't want to make wrong comparisons, but um, it's maybe by the, yani maybe we are living in this culture of impunity because uh, Lebanon is not really surrounded by democratic countries. And uh, so, I mean, yes, in, 19, in 89, we had the Taif Agreement, which officially ended uh, years of bloody civil war. But in the same time, a part, uh, two or several parts of Lebanon stayed under occupation. Right. Israeli so occupation and Syrian occupation. Also, um, there was, I think, there was not really a, a uh, the freedom of that Lebanon at any moment could really decide for itself. But I mean, there was also mainly uh, uh, for years a Syrian agenda. If it's uh, at least until 2005 mm -hmm. and for sure also until today. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, Lebanon didn't really, um, I don't want to understand this as an excuse. Huh? Of course, I mean, the, the former warlords, I mean, they also, of course, they were holding to power and, uh, but, and for sure, there were, uh, there were a lot of, lot of calls that uh, to remove them, but there was also not an international I don't know, um, support 
to, to have a new starting point for Lebanon. Right. So, um, but I profoundly, profoundly believe that it is really this culture of impunity uh, for crimes committed during the civil war, for crimes uh, committed after the civil war, for crimes committed uh, like for the crime of your father, of the crime which, uh, of Lukman. Um, it's this culture, uh, it's this impunity, it's this culture of impunity, which is allowing more and more and more crimes. And um, I, Yane, I, I would love to know more how you felt, but when I'm, uh, I, and I'm sure you were also, you must have had these moments where you were telling yourself, I mean, I will do everything that this crime will be, Yani, there will be justice. Huh? And uh, what is really pushing me today uh, and uh, is, is, is this call for justice, if you want. I mean, I want, I really want to know uh, why. And I want punishment. A few weeks ago, in, two months ago in January, I, uh, I wrote a piece about this exact issue. It was in Lorient Le Jour, translated back to English Lorient today, about the, the, the central component of justice, that we cannot mourn justice, cannot throw this under the bus. You can't throw it away. There's no point in rebuilding a society if you're throwing away justice. And um, it's an article written seven years after my father's assassination. And everything you're saying right now, word for word, it's exactly how I felt since that day. And, you know, I, I mean, it, that when, I, when I talk about these things almost on a daily basis, it feels like time is frozen. Except when I look at myself on these Zoom cameras, I realize that my aging has taken its toll. So time clearly hasn't frozen. It's actually been moving very, very quickly. But I, I share the sentiment wholeheartedly. And you're talking about something that I, I, try to, I try to flush out all the time, which is the neighborhood is important and, and sovereignty is important. The environment played a heavy role in this country. And yes, I mean, we talk about the civil war, but the truth is the Syrian mismanagement of Lebanon lasted just as long as the, as the civil war. In the last 15 years, we've experienced a different version of it, albeit not the Syrian regime, but happens to be Hezbollah. So these are 45 years now, up to half a century of that kind of memory loss, if you will. And it happens violently. And um, I can't imagine even trying to touch on the, the smaller things without addressing the big issue of justice, impunity. And I know maybe I'm bringing this up too quickly. Maybe we can touch on it and kind of go back in time, but uh, you've made it very clear in your recent statements. You've made it very clear, not just in sort of outlets or social media, uh, you've made it clear in, in principle that uh, we cannot be afraid and we should have no fear, zero fear, sifr khof, when it comes to Hezbollah. I think that kind of terminology, I think uh, allows a lot of people that are hesitating to speak more. And I think it sends the right signal across the board that intimidation, keep trying, it won't work. Long-term, this is a lost cause on their side. And um, I'm saying this as somebody who never had the, the, the correct terminology to do something similar like that, but feels the same thing. And I'm talking to you seven years after my own sort of personal experience. I don't know if it's too late. 
I see your enthusiasm for your pursuit. And I know that it, I know what it feels like, but uh, we're not the only two. The numbers are too long. And I don't know. I don't know if, if this whole, I don't know if we will live long enough to see uh, justice take hold. And I, I'm sorry to start off this section a bit on the pessimistic note, but maybe it's appropriate. Do you hold out any hope that you will have justice? where those criminals will be punished. And I know that you've, I know you want it. That's what I want. That's what I live for. But I don't know if I'll ever have it. I want to have hope. Yes, <laughs> let's say it like that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, I have a little hope, yes. I mean, um, I'm not doing this only because it should be done or by principle. No, personally, uh, I mean, I will dedicate my life now to this because this is now the only thing which makes really sense for me. And uh, I must say, I have a little hope. I mean, I, and I hope also I will not be disappointed. But um, I, I, I feel there, um, there was a red line, which was, um, it was too much. Yeah, they, uh, it, it was really too much. I must say, yes, I have some hope. And um, I want to have hope. And let's see, really, let's see. Monica, may I uh, ask you, what, what, is that, what is that red line to you? Because I can imagine it, but I don't want to, I, want, I don't want to assume. I'd like to know, what, what do you mean by that they crossed a red line? Is it, is it simply that they went after someone like your husband? That that, uh, is, that was a line that they had not crossed before, and they're now crossing something that was not maybe that he was behind the line in the past, but they've that they've redrawn the line. Yeah, let me try. I, I'm thinking now why I used this term. Huh? Now I I have to understand. <laughs> but uh, well, welcome welcome to my world where I talk and then reconsider everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I would say somehow Lokman was the most prominent Shia anti Hezbollah voice. And um, so they went at least in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, so they went, they went immediately to the top. This is maybe what I try to say. Right, right. And I mean, you can somehow compare the assassination of Lukman with the assassination in Iraq of Hashemi. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a kind of, um, I'm saying very well, Yanni, I'm trying to, it's the most prominent Shia anti Hezbollah voice. I mean, I know that there are a lot of other voices, mm, but mm. the most if it's coming from their, uh, their circles. Their... So in this sense, they really went to the top. I'm trying to, yeah. So they, in other words, may have overstepped with this assassination, that they actually went too far. With that, I hope I'm getting this right, that the consequences are more severe with somebody like Lukman within, within their base. Yeah, I mean, because he, well, Lokman was somebody extremely cultivated, extremely, mm. with a new, huge, 
knowledge. Uh, yani he, he was a master in Arabic. He could really, with, the lang with his language, he was able to attack them where it was hurting. So, um, um, I yeah. lo I love I love that you started off the I mean m minutes after it became known how 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 Lukman died that you went with zero fear as your as your way of saying this will not go unpunished because I think whether or not these criminals are in jail one day or whether or not they're punished I think in your own way you have punished them. And I think I agree. This is a line that they crossed and they, are, they have crossed it many times in the past, but this time around, the backlash is felt. I, I'm curious from your side, in the last 15 years, I know, that, I know that there was some light damage that happened during the July war, but that sort of umam was put back together very quickly. Can you describe your life in Khbairi the last 15 years? And I mean it in, in many ways, not just Lukman's sort of vigor and his critique, and sometimes very, very uh, straight to the point. And I used to see him on TV. I, I'd read, I mean, I knew, I knew that this was a prominent Hezbollah critic in Khbairi. I think we all knew, but uh, on your side, did you sense that there was a, a shift happening in the last 15 years where somebody like Lukman was no longer welcome in Ikhbayri? That, In other words, you didn't have maybe the community that maybe he wished for, and that was disappearing gradually. And as I asked this as somebody who rarely set foot in Ikhbayri the last 15 years. So if, if you saw that happening up front. Um, there were wakes, if you want. I would mm. talk about Wakes. I, I'm not talking about a constant situation, but for example, when Al Akbar started uh, its hate campaign mm -hmm. in 2012, this was a campaign which meant social isolation. So, uh, Lokman, whenever somebody here in the quarter died, he used to go to funerals like everybody right. else. Yes. So, of course, I mean, um, Hezbollah over the years, they tried almost everything. It went from social isolation uh, to, uh, where, which, for example, therefore I was talking about funerals, which he could feel when he was going to a funeral mm. to direct sweats. Um, like in 2019, when uh, we had uh, all the walls full of... Yes, of uh, course. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, um, um, Hezbollah had used different tactics to imitate people, to, uh, to make our life difficult. There were also, there were all, we were organizing exhibitions, we were organizing in the Hungar, we were organizing film screenings, we were organizing round tables, they were spreading the rumors that I was organizing orgies with prostitutes from Morocco and Jordan, to say it clearly. And so they, there were all these tactics. But in the same time, people from the neighborhood never stopped to come. So, mm -hmm. and this was also the beauty somehow of whatever we did in the Hangar. I mean, Lokman was really a lot of our, not everybody living here in the neighborhood is, uh, is, is pro Hezbollah. Right. So right. people never stop to come. I mean, uh, yes, I can talk very long time about the negative sides, but there were also a lot of positive sides. I mean, we, there are a lot of neighbors 
who um, who were glad that the hangar was existing, that there was a cultural space in this area, mm. that people from the outside were finally coming to the space, and um, and was what was also really nice, and I hope it will stay nice. As I mean, normally, if you go to Mamikael, if you go to Hamra to see an exhibition, you will spend an hour in the exhibition, then you will go to the next bar or the next cafe or restaurant to have dinner. Right. And um, so now here we don't have bars, we don't have restaurants, we don't have dinners next to us. So we were serving wine, <laughs> alcohol, as uh, we were serving juice, we were serving water, whatever you want, but also a glass of wine. And um, yeah, and people stayed the whole evening. So it was not always about an exhibition or about a film screening, but it was also creating a kind of meeting point where also people are meeting, which are not always meeting. So to our, in our public included the cultural public, which is moving around the cultural places in spaces in Beirut. It included, um, it included people from the neighborhood. It included uh, Palestinian refugees from mm. the camp. Mm. Mm. Of the camp are very close, Sabra and Shatila and Boshne Brajne. It included Syrian activists, it included ambassadors, it included um, clerics, anti Hezbollah clerics. So it's a, it was really, uh, and it's a mixture of people who are not always meeting. And is, right. this is really something beautiful because it's, it's much more, it's really creating a meeting point. And a part, really a big part of our neighborhood, because I mean, um, I see my neighborhood every day, um, they were happy that this was happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I have never been somehow, uh, yes, I mean, it's uh, a lot of people are saying it's a kind of oasis here, but I mean, it required a lot of work and uh, to make it in an oasis. Mm. And um, it required a lot of work, which we did, because we felt it is important to have this meeting point here. And one of our, my, just one word about the Dach here, I mean, the southern suburbs of Beirut, one of my favorite exhibitions we ever did was an exhibition we just did after the war of 2006, mm. which had the title Collecting Dachia. Mm. So yeah. where we were using archives, um, yani where we were telling the slow transformation of this region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, uh, with stories, I mean, it was a kind of storytelling exhibition, um, yeah, showing this transformation until 2006 when a part was destroyed. I actually associate Lukman and many people that I deeply admire in recent history as, as storytellers. Yeah. I, I, my tour used to end with Samir Asir. I would actually end the tour with a storyteller trying to share the pain of Beirut on his terms. And a man who dabbles in politics a bit, uh, somebody I think who celebrated this unifying structure you're describing, real cosmopolitanism in the cafes and theater of, of Hamra, uh, but a melting pot, if you will, and somebody who, who loved diversity, real diversity. And he gets killed once he crosses a line that was drawn in 2005. I, I think of, and I say this carefully, I, I know it's not the same occupation. I know it's a very different trajectory. But when I think back of my father, I think of somebody who was trying to tell a story. Maybe it's a political one. 
Maybe it's one that's not exactly artistic, but I think of him as, as trying to capture and reflect and offer maybe the wider picture. And I see somebody like Lukman, who's obviously that's his profession by default. And then I always found it tricky to try to even honor these people without it sounding like I'm taking sides. But I know this now that there are certain things you have to take sides with. And you said it before, and I'll, I'll echo it again. There can be no tolerance for this abnormal ending to storytellers or whatever you want to call them, martyrs or heroes, whatever the name is, and whatever terminology anyone wants to apply to them, the good and the bad, they don't deserve this ending. And I think that's a side you can't back down from. And I, I, I wonder whether or not too many people have, have adjusted to this abnormality. And I'll ask you a, a sensitive question here. And the days after Lukman Slim's assassination, when, when we crossed paths, or even maybe the weeks after, there was a momentum. Most of it may be visible online, but it was also visible in Samir Asir Square. I went to that rally. It couldn't be a, a better place to reflect on somebody like Lukman. You saw brave people screaming and shouting the right things, risking themselves by being exposed, but they're saying it openly. Many articles written, many, many articles written with the emphasis on justice as well. We're in mid-March, and on my side, I don't want to sound in any way hostile by saying this. On the contrary, it's more out of more out of uh, disappointment, maybe, that enough people I know simply don't have the appetite to keep talking about these things. That assassinations are just too too part of life here, and I wonder if that's how you feel. Not the, not the pursuit of justice, not your own ambition, not even keeping Umam going, which is a hard task on its own, not that. More in that even, even potentially the, friend, the friends and the allies, they move on. And then this, like, this feeling of you're on your own increasingly settles in. And maybe I'm asking this question too soon, but this is how I felt uh, seven years ago. And, and I wonder if it, it feels the same for you. No, no, no. it doesn't feel the same for me. Okay. Um, it's, uh, how to say it? Danny, I, there is a kind of solidarity um, happening around me. Uh, for Lukman, which uh, and, uh, sometimes I just hope that he will see it. It's also <laughs> that, uh, now, which is just unbelievable. Yani, and really, um, I mean, I just hope and um, no, I really don't feel this because really there are so many people um, who who have caused the work. Um, I don't want to say now Lokman or Umam is doing because it's the same. Mm. Uh, who are coming back? Who are uh, who are calling? Who are waiting for me to Yanni to to act if you want so, and. Mm. Mm to keep his legacy alive so that it's just somehow I feel, I hope that I have the strength to do all this. Now, to be honest, I, um, uh, no, I don't have this feeling. Well, I, I, I really don't, no, I really don't have. That is very I, reassuring I, to hear. I don't feel, um, I mean, and I have yani, we visitors, uh, yani, people are still coming. We will celebrate this 40th day. And no, I feel uh, that I hope that I have the capacity and uh, the strength 
to do all this, but no, the death, no, I, no, people I'm seeing or I'm talking to, uh, it didn't pass yet. No, I don't feel alone. That's reassuring. I feel, so, yeah, so, I feel alone because I mean, I'm used to live with a man, but right. uh, I, in this sense, I feel very alone, but, um, but in the same time, I feel not alone because I feel he's here and, uh, and the support is here. I think those are the words that somebody like, like me needs to hear from time to time. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that's how you feel. It, it's reassuring. I find it quite odd that the men and women, whoever, the Lebanese that pursue collective memory in this country, and they're offering a, a historical text, they're offering resource for us, that those that love this country a little too much end up getting killed. And it is a very, very sad acknowledgement that it's people that are willing to even maybe do more than just document and research, maybe offer a way out, that they're the ones that get killed. And there's too many decent people that have been killed trying to fix this country, not from abroad, but from here. And they spend, the re- they spend their lives in Lebanon knowing that it's a threat to them. They live out their last days well aware that this is going to perhaps lead to, a, lead to their murder. But nothing can be done to convince them otherwise. These are patriots and heroes in Lebanon. And I've seen it from your own posts and maybe even articles that you've shared from time to time. And they're the same things that I read, and it's the same sentiment, really, that there is a concern that perhaps the years that you described in the early 1990s, that this acceptance of Syrian hegemony is potentially being replaced by Iranian persuasion, Iranian proxy vis-a-vis Hezbollah. And that we're going through now a new era of a different type of subjugation. I see that as a real threat. And I see that not necessarily the intention of other players that negotiate and do whatever bargains they need to do with Iran, but that this is a collateral, that this is a consequence. And Lebanon is paying the price. And I'm wondering if you see it this way, that we may end up in a situation where, at least for the time being, Hezbollah wins, not by popularity. The whole country can be against them, but not that. That their militia and Iran's, Iran's security needs, that regime's survivability depends too hard, depends too much on Lebanon. And that we're entering now a new stage where it's just the same story with Hezbollah. And I'm curious if that's the way you see it or if you see something else that perhaps, no, this is not a fait accompli. It's impossible for me to imagine and it was impossible for Lukman to imagine that um, all of a sudden you have, uh, you have a flowering democracy here in Lebanon and you have a civil war and, uh, right. in, in Syria. Mm-hmm. You, you are dealing with the same players. Mm-hmm. Hezbollah was profoundly involved in the Syrian war. We are dealing in this whole region, is it, we are Iran, Syria, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, we are dealing with the same players. And in this sense, we need efforts for a regional solution. Mm. And you see our story now more tied to the region than before in that sense. Yeah, I see. Yes, I see mm. the story of Lebanon extremely tied uh, to the region. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I said, is involved uh, in Syria militarily. 
Um, I mean, and even if you think about the revolution, I mean, how yeah. how we are about how often you have seen? Uh, I have seen a lot of uh, posters, etc., which were connecting sure. Lebanon yeah. to the park. Right. And personally, really, it's uh, how you want to imagine uh, a peaceful, democratic, healthy Lebanon. And uh, you have Syria next to you. It's impossible. That could almost even imply the reasons why shared collective memory in these countries is increasing. We're all yes. going through familiar stories now. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Which are deeply connected. So all efforts for me, I don't believe anymore in, in any initiative which wants somehow to solve here something in Lebanon. Mm. We need a kind of Marshall plan for the region. And that is sort of geopolitical by default, that the answers are unfortunately, the, the big answers or the big questions even are asked abroad and are answered abroad as well, despite the valiant effort of locals across mm. the region, brave Syrians, brave Iraqis, brave Yemeni, and now for many years, brave Lebanese too, that meet the same fate. I'm glad you brought up Hashem al Hashemi, because that is almost a, it's, it is a parallel story to ours. Yes. Absolutely. I look forward to seeing you soon. I know we've talked about it several times. I know we're going to make it happen as well. And I think we have a very, uh, <laughs> we may have a similar sense of humor because you make me laugh in a way that I, I mean, it's a very, very good way of making me laugh when we speak on the phone in private. I just automatically start laughing and you're, you're able to get to me well. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Even when things are falling apart, I'm, I'm chuckling on the phone with you. And it's almost, uh, it's refreshing. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you soon. I really love the fact that you opened your home to Beirut at a time where uh, a lot of us felt injured in different ways. You uh, obviously, it, it hit home. And you, Rasha, Lukman's mom, just sharing your world with the city. Uh, it meant a lot. It meant a lot for me to see you then. And it means a great deal to do this with you. And I'll see you soon. And uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're, you're inspiring someone like me who who's not... Uh, maybe always as optimistic. And I know from my own conversations with, with friends, with family, uh, you're inspiring a new generation of Lebanese. So don't stop what you're doing. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Ronnie. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>